So what I will talk about, um, first of all, is the motivations behind doing centralized traffic engineering, given that in the past years, people doing traffic engineering have been doing it in a distributed way. Why do it in a centralized manner? What's so good about that? Then I will talk about some of the key protocol mechanisms required to build a real-time traffic engineering controller. So these um, key protocol ingredients are BGP LS and Path Computation Element Protocol, or PSEP for short. And then finally, I'll talk about an example implementation of a TE controller, which is our Northstar um, product. So by way of introduction, if you consider how the path that traffic takes through a network is determined, many people today are using shortest path routing. And so the um, next hop for the packet is determined on a hop-by-hop -hop basis as the packet propagates through the network. And that's based on SPF algorithms um, done by each um, router along the path. Now, some people take things one step further and do distributed traffic engineering, which is shown in the middle of the diagram. Now, with that, each router has a view of the topology of the network and, furthermore, knows how much bandwidth is available on each link in the network. And from that, each router makes um, decisions for the path um, for all the LSPs that start from it going to the other routers in the network. Now, in so doing, each router only has visibility of the paths that um, it needs to create. It doesn't have visibility of any of the other demands in the network. And so if you consider this as a traffic matrix, where we see all the n-squared demands in the network, if you consider router B, router B only knows about how much traffic it needs to send to other routers in the network. It's got no visibility of the other demands. This can lead to conflicts and inefficiencies. Now, the ultimate is to have centralized traffic engineering. We have a centralized controller, which as well as having knowledge of the topology of the network, how much bandwidth is available on each link, it has knowledge of the full view of packet demands network-wide. Because it's got this full visibility, it can better resolve conflicts and can create a more optimum set of LSPs to satisfy all of these different um, traffic demands. So let's have a look at that in a bit more detail if we look at some of the advantages of a centralized controller. First of all, the centralized controller can avoid the classic TE blocking problem that occurs in distributed path computation. And I'll show you a diagram of that in a minute. Also, you can compute a global optimum for a set of traffic engineered paths. So you can make more efficient use of the network resources. And I'll show you some slides that illustrate that in a minute. And also, it allows you to use more sophisticated algorithms than CSPF. And so you can have um, cost functions that take into account latency, for example, if that's one of the um, prime directives that determines the path that you want to compute through the network. Also, you can deal with particular service requirements like path diversity, being able to create pairs of LSPs that don't share fate as they travel through the network. Also, you get greater predictability in how paths are placed. Um, if you have distributed path computation, if a router goes offline, um, for example, for maintenance, when it comes back up, the LSPs could be following completely different paths through the network because the resources that it had been using before it went offline have now been taken by other paths coming from different routers. These routers aren't acting in unison, and so you can get some um, unpredictability in the path taken by traffic as a function of time. Also, if a central controller has got knowledge of the future, if it's got knowledge of demands that will be needed, let's say, in four hours' time, it can take those into account when it's computing paths that are needed now um, to avoid having to tear down those paths or have to move them around in four hours' time. So you get more consistency by having a view into the future as well. So those are some of the key advantages. Let's have a look at some slides to um, show some of these points in more detail. So this is the classic LSP blocking problem that occurs with distributed traffic engineering. Suppose that P1 has um, a requirement for a LSP going to PE3, and it needs a bandwidth um, reservation of 20 units. 
On each of these links in the core of the network, after the slash, you can see the size of each link. And the number before the slash is how much um, bandwidth has currently been reserved. And so PE1 computes the shortest path that meets the bandwidth requirements, and it's, it goes um, via P1 and P2 to um, P3. Now, that's fine from um, PE1's point of view, but what if now P2 needs to set up an LSP going to P3 with 90 units of bandwidth reservation? It, aren't, it can't actually do it. Um, the um, placement of that LSP is blocked by the presence of the green one because there's only 80 units of bandwidth available between P1 and P2. And on these other links, on this part of the triangle, there's only 50 units of bandwidth available anyway. And so this 90-unit LSP is completely blocked from being set up. There's nothing that um, PE2 can do to tell P1 of the problem because there isn't a communications mechanism between the routers with respect to traffic engineering. Now, of course, if you have a distributed, um, if you have a centralized controller, then it has knowledge of both of those demands, and so it can take both of those demands into account and do the optimum path computation taking that into account. And so, of course, in this simple example, the centralized controller would put the 20-unit LSP going around like this in order to accommodate the 90-unit LSP going across the top like this. So this is um, the classic TE blocking problem that occurs with distributed traffic engineering that's solved by using a centralized controller. Now, this is a very extreme case where um, an LSP was completely blocked from being set up um, from one router because of the presence of another LSP from another router. In a real network, perhaps even if you're using distributed traffic engineering, all of the LSPs in practice would um, be able to be set up. But there are more subtle effects where, with the distributed traffic engineering, the um, set of LSPs, globally speaking, are not optimum. And we can have a look at an example now to illustrate that. So suppose we have this network here, and all of the links in this network have um, 10 gigs of bandwidth availability. They're all 10 gig links. And let's suppose all the IGP metrics are equal on each of the links to keep the example um, simple. And suppose that router A has set up an LSP going to router X with four gigs of bandwidth reservation. It um, computes the shortest path that's capable of supporting that amount of traffic, and so it computes this path ALMX, which is the shortest path that meets the requirements. Similarly, B needs to set up an LSP going to Z, again with four units of bandwidth reservation. There's six units of bandwidth available here still, so it can take this shortest path through the network, and it succeeds in setting up the LSP. Now, suppose now that um, we need another LSP, this time going from router C to router Z, again with four units of bandwidth, then um, C can't take this shortest path across to Z because there's only two units of bandwidth available on this link. Um, we need four units of bandwidth for the LSP. And so C is forced to take a longer path, which goes around the network as shown here by the purple arrow. So this um, purple LSP is taking a rather long path um, to reach Z um, in order to find a path that meets our bandwidth requirement of um, four units. So this is what has happened um, in the distributed path computation case. And the fact that this LSP took um, this longer path was, in effect, as a result of a race condition. These LSPs happened to be set up first, which prevented this one taking a short path, and so it's following a longer path um, through the network. Now, if you had a centralized controller that was computing all of these paths, knowing all of these different demands, then it would be doing a global um, path computation and finding the global optimum for these um, LSPs. And so we'd end up with something looking like this. The consequence of this is that, on average, um, these LSPs are following um, a shorter path. If you take the sum of the number of hops um, consumed by each LSP, it's less than in the distributed path computation case. And so network-wide, we're using fewer resources. These flows are crossing fewer links, crossing fewer router interfaces, and so less resources are being consumed. If you extend this to a very large network with hundreds or thousands of LSPs going in all sorts of directions, then if with centralized path computation, the LSPs um, on average are shorter, 
and you're consuming fewer network resources. Or putting it another way, for a given topology and sizes of links, you can push more traffic through the network than if you were using distributed path computation. So this is a key advantage of the centralized path computation model. The other thing with centralized path computation is, of course, it can help in dynamic situations. So if a link breaks, then um, some of the resources are no longer available between L and M. That link's not there. And so the centralized controller can compute the optimum path, um, bearing in mind this new, um, you know, more constrained topology in order that all of the LSPs, you know, still get through with the minimum possible path length, bearing in mind the new um, topologies. It's important that the centralized controller has real-time coupling to the network so it can um, take account of changes in the real network. Another aspect um, related to um, traffic management is um, dynamically um, splitting LSPs, which a central controller lends itself um, too well. So imagine um, at this point in time, we're thinking about the amount of traffic going from router A to router E across the network. And at this point in time, um, that traffic has a volume of 7 gigs, and it's following the path ABE, that's the LSP that's been computed by the central controller um, for this traffic. Now suppose the traffic um, increases, perhaps we're getting towards the busy hour of the day, and this traffic um, is now approaching 10 gigs. And suppose 10 gigs is too much to send you know, for one LSP across um, one path through the network. What the controller can do is make a dynamic decision to actually split the traffic across two um, separate LSPs. And so instead of having one um, 10 gig LSP, what we now have is two LSPs following different paths through the network, each carrying five gigs of traffic. And so the controller can be taking advantage of the fact that perhaps on this part of the network it's relatively quiet, less traffic, and can actually use it for some of this um, large traffic flows. And what the ingress route should, would be doing, of course, is ECMPing the traffic across these two LSPs. And then if um, over time the traffic um, decreases between A and E, then the controller can um, reduce the number of LSPs. And so we can um, have a situation perhaps the traffic falls back down to four gigs, and so we end up with just one LSP um, going through the network, for example, as shown here. So this is another um, advantage where a central controller can take um, account of varying traffic demands and change the number of LSPs and their paths um, between any two points in the network. So what I have been talking about so far are cases in which we are using the central controller to perform traffic optimization tasks, improve the use of the network resources. There's another class of problems that the central controller can solve, which are very difficult to solve with distributed path computation, which relates to um, service requirements rather than um, efficiency requirements. And the classic example of that is um, what's known as path diversity. Um, in the SDH world, it's very common when people order a pair of private circuits, let's say a customer orders a pair of E1 private circuits, um, that they request a path diversity option, which means that the two circuits must not use any of the same links or nodes, because if a node or a link goes down, then that only affects at most one circuit and not both. So you're avoiding any fate sharing. Completely um, standard option in the circuit switched world. Now what's happening is that many operators are considering um, switching off their SDH network, migrating um, the private circuits to um, a packet network-based service, um, for example, MPLS-based pseudowires. And so that same requirement now gets put onto the packet network, the ability to create um, LSPs with diverse paths um, in order to underpin these path-diverse pseudowires. Now bear in mind that the strict path diversity requirement is that the two LSPs actually start on different ingress PEs. So the blue one starting on PE1, the red one on PE2, the red one ends on PE4, and the blue one on PE3. And PE3 and PE4 are probably in the same pop as are PE1 and PE2. If you ask PE1 and PE2 to compute the paths for their um, LSPs, then they've got no way of um, comparing notes. They've got no way of communicating to each other what path they've computed for their respective LSPs. And so what might happen is, if you're unlucky, these LSPs actually share fate somewhere in the middle of the network. And so both the red and the blue are passing through that same um, P-router. 
Of course, if you assign the problem to a centralized controller and you tell it that these LSPs have a requirement for path diversity, then of course it can successfully um, compute the paths to be properly um, diverse. So it's solving a problem that's very difficult to solve in the um, distributed path computation case. This example that I've just shown you is for point-to-point -point LSPs, but also a similar requirement exists for point-to-multipoint LSPs. Um, point-to-multipoint LSPs, um, which are traffic engineered using RSVP, are used um, very often for things like broadcast television or real-time market data, and there is a path diversity requirement for that. So you've got the red um, point-to-multipoint LSP starting at PE1, um, the blue um, starting at PE2, Often they're used in live, live fashion, so you've got exactly the same data going down both for reasons of um, resilience. And at the application layer, um, these receivers are reconciling these flows and discarding the one that's not needed if both are arriving. And um, these must be engineered to be um, completely diverse in terms of ingress PEs, egress PEs, and nodes and links in the middle. And again, a centralized controller can successfully compute the paths to achieve that requirement. Another um, application that a central controller lends itself to very well is bandwidth calendar calendaring. Um, this is where um, a particular LSP to carry a particular traffic isn't needed forever, but is just needed for a particular period of time. Again, this is used a lot in the broadcast television industry. There might be a sports event. Um, you need an LSP to carry the um, video stream from that, and you just need it on Tuesday evening from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., and after that, it's not needed anymore. And so you um, program the controller um, with this future requirement. You tell it um, what are the um, ingress point and egress points, um, the time at which it's needed to start, the end time, if there's an end time, and then automatically at the time um, required, um, the um, controller installs that LSP into the network ready to carry the um, traffic of the required um, bandwidth. Another aspect which I alluded to um, before um, relates to um, different types of path computation algorithm. So um, routers, when they're doing distributed path computation for um, traffic engineered LSPs, um, use an algorithm known as CSPF. If you have a centralized controller with more um, computing power, um, you can have fancier algorithms. And so, for example, if for a particular um, service, latency is the overriding criterion, you want to minimize the latency, then if it has um, latency um, parameters um, in its database, it can compute the lowest latency path. Um, if you've got ECMP paths in a network because you've got symmetric metrics, sometimes between a particular source and destination, you might have 16 possible paths, which from the metric point of view look equal, but only one of those 16 sometimes is physically the shortest path, and so it's picking that particular path for your um, special low latency LSP that you can do by using latency as part of your um, cost function. Now, um, from a sort of operational point of view, another useful advantage of a central controller um, is related to maintenance. If you want to take a router down for uh, maintenance in the um, network, it might have lots of LSPs passing through it. And so it's useful to have an orderly way of um, moving those LSPs away from that node um, before you um, take it down for maintenance and move them back afterwards. And so what you do is, in the controller, you mark that node as being um, ready for maintenance at a certain time. You say, at 7 p.m. tonight, I'm going to take it out for maintenance. And so a bit before that, the controller moves all the LSPs away from it, and so now you can um, do your maintenance um, quite happily. And then at the end, you tell the controller that you've finished, and the controller automatically moves LSPs back um, as required through that node. So that gives a very sort of gentle, orderly way of moving LSPs as away and um, bringing them back in a sort of make-before-break manner. So that's a flavor of some of the applications of a centralized um, controller. What I want to do now is to talk to you about some of the key protocol ingredients. Um, what are the key protocol ingredients required to have a centralized controller that has real-time coupling to the network in terms of knowing the real-time topology of the network, um, bandwidth availability, how does it know the status of LSPs in the network, and how does it actually install um, LSPs into the network, and how does it alter the parameters of existing LSPs? So we'll look at um, this next.
So the first thing what I, so I want to talk about is um, path computation element protocol, or PSEP for short. And this is a diagram that illustrates that. This is something that's been around in the IETF um, for a few years now, since about the mid-2000s. Um, and these are the RFCs that um, correspond to that. And in the PCE model, what you have is the um, central um, machine that's doing the path computation. And that's known as the path computation element, or PCE for short. And then on the other hand, you have the path computation clients. These are the actual ingress routers of the LSPs. And so what happens is that the PCE um, computes the path of an LSP, and then using the path computation element protocol, um, tells the ingress router the details of the paths. So it tells it the precise um, set of hops that the LSP must follow through the network, um, the identity of each node and link that the LSP must pass through, and also the bandwidth um, reservation on the LSP, and also the priority level of the LSP. All of those are um, set by the um, central controller and passed to the um, ingress router um, using um, the PSEP protocol. Then, in turn, the ingress router um, signals for that LSP to be set up um, using RSVP, and then it signals back up to the controller um, a confirmation that the LSP is indeed up and running. And so the controller has real-time visibility of the fact that the LSP is actually up and um, carrying traffic. So that's the essence of um, PSEP um, protocol. Now, the original PSEP um, drafts and most of the work were assuming back in the mid-2000s that people would be using what's known as a passive um, PCE model, where um, basically the ingress router um, says to the um, central controller, I want a path with um, these attributes, please can you compute it for me? But in fact, in the last couple of years, what's become the hot topic is um, active stateful PCE, where the controller retains knowledge of all the LSPs that are present in the network and can actually alter the paths of LSPs um, when it needs to, existing LSPs, it can change the paths. And furthermore, it can actually instantiate new LSPs completely from scratch. So as driven by um, the network operator through the GUI, or as driven by um, other um, controlling applications through the API, um, this um, TE controller is actually installing completely new LSPs into the network. And so really in that model, um, it's the PCE rather than the routers themselves that's the entity that's driving changes um, in the network. So it's dictating the order of operations um, network-wide and creating new states. That's very much in line with the SDN um, paradigm, of course. So in fact, in a network, you could actually have um, three different types of LSP um, coexisting if you wanted to. Um, you could have a vanilla LSP, as I call it. So this is an LSP that's been um, set up by an ingress router in the traditional way. So the ingress router has computed the path using CSPF. It's um, signaled that path using RSVP. However, if a central controller is present, um, the ingress router reports to the controller the existence of that LSP and its parameters, its path and its bandwidth reservation and so on. And so, in fact, PSEP can be used as a discovery protocol in order for um, each ingress router to report the existence of LSPs, even though the controller in this um, case of this particular LSP can't you know, change that LSP. Um, the other type of LSP that you might have present is um, a delegated LSP. So this is one which has been configured on the ingress router. And the ingress router initially computed it using CSPF, um, signaled it through the network using um, RSVP. Um, nevertheless, um, the ingress router can choose to delegate it to the controller. What that means is that over time, the controller can actually alter parameters of that LSP. It can um, change the path taken that by that LSP as a consequence of optimization routines. It can change the um, bandwidth reservation in accordance with um, different um, traffic demands over time. Then the third type of LSP is PCE-initiated LSP. So this is a situation where the PCE has actually decided to set up an LSP completely from scratch. This is an LSP that doesn't exist currently in the network. The controller decides to set up that LSP, signals to the ingress router using PSEP to set it up, 
And in effect, it's sending an order. It's saying to the router, you must set up this LSP with these um, parameters. And the ingress router signals for that LSP to be set up. And then it replies um, to the controller saying, you know, it's up and running um, as a confirmation. So associated um, with this, um, there are um, certain um, new functions that have been added to um, PSEP over the past couple of years to um, deal with um, these types of um, PCE-initiated LSPs or um, delegated LSPs. And so um, one of the key functions is delegations. So that's how the PCE actually delegates an existing LSP um, to the controller. Then there is um, reporting. This is how a PCE reports the state of LSPs. So this might be one which isn't controlled by the controller. Um, nevertheless, um, as I mentioned before, the um, PCE reports its um, state, the fact that it exists, its path, and its um, bandwidth. Then there's updates. This is how a PCE updates the attributes of an LSP delegated to it. It alters the path or the bandwidth. And then instantiation. Um, this is how um, the controller actually creates a new LSP completely from scratch and conversely tears it down if it's no longer needed. So these are all new functions that have been added to PCEP over the last couple of years um, to take account of this new active stateful PCE paradigm. Now PCE and PCEP, when it first was formulated, assumed that um, RSVP signaling would be used to actually set up the LSP um, through the network. More interestingly, or more recently, um, there's been interest in um, something called Spring in the industry, which is a different way of having um, traffic follow a traffic engineered path um, through the network, you know, a source routed um, path. And so, from the controller point of view, when it comes to path computation, um, in a sense, the path computation is agnostic as to um, whether the LSP finally will be set up using RSVP or um, Spring. And so all that's needed is some modifications to um, PSEP to tell um, the ingress router that rather than setting up the um, LSP using RSVP, it uses Spring to um, set it up. And it actually sends the corresponding um, Spring label stack um, to the ingress router. So there's a draft in the IETF which talks about um, alterations to um, PCE to accommodate um, this spring type of model. As I say, from the controller point of view, um, from the path computation side, it's actually agnostic anyway, so it's not too much of a um, big thing to um, accommodate this type of model. So that's a flavor of um, PSEP. What I want to talk about now is another very important um, protocol ingredient, which is known as BGP um, link state, or BGP LS for um, short. Um, so by way of background, um, what BGPLS is, is it's a mechanism to carry traffic engineering link state information via um, BGP. So this is information that typically is carried within an IGP area using IGP traffic engineering extensions. BGPLS allows this um, information to be carried um, beyond an individual IGP area. And so it's carrying information such as bandwidth availability on each link, um, link colors or admin groups that have been configured, um, SRLGs that um, this link is a member of. And in fact, there are two major categories of application for it. One in distributed path computation is solving the inter-domain path computation problem. Um, with inter-domain path computation, traditionally it's been a bit tricky because um, the ingress router hasn't got visibility across other IGP areas or other ASs, and so it's a bit hit and miss whether it can successfully um, compute a path that meets its requirement. There's things like loose hop expansion at ABRs or ASBRs, um, but um, it doesn't solve the problem in itself of um, the ingress router not having full visibility. With BGPLS, you can give the ingress router full visibility of the topology of the entire um, network, even other IGP areas and so on. But in the context of today's talk, um, we're interested in BGPLS as a TE topology reporting protocol. So this is how um, the central controller can um, discover the real-time topology of the network. And this is a lot cleaner than using either IGP peerings or indeed CLI um, scraping. And so this is the traditional way that you might have given the central controller visibility 
of the traffic engineering parameters of each link in the network. If you've got these different IGP areas with these red dotted lines, then because of the scope of the IGP traffic engineering ex extensions only being intra-area, you'd have to have um, a separate IGP peering from the central controller into each of these different areas. Now, probably the central controller isn't physically connected to each of those areas. You end up doing messy things like having to have GRE tunnels um, going into each um, IGP area with IGP peering across it. If you add another IGP area to the network, you have to set up um, another of these GRE tunnels. So it gets a bit um, painful. You can solve this problem by using the BGPLS. And so what BGPLS is doing is chopping up um, the information that is normally carried by the traffic engineering IGP extensions, things like um, admin groups, um, available link bandwidth, IGP metric, um, SRLGs, is dicing it up into um, TLVs carried by BGP, and those can be um, propagated through the BGP infrastructure network-wide and indeed to the controller. And so in that model, the um, central controller, in principle, could just have one um, BGPLS session with a BGPLS speaker in the network, too, for resilience in practice. And as long as you've got, as you've got a, a set of BGPLS peering um, sessions between different areas, that's all you need. So you can um, more easily um, get um, the real-time information into the central um, controller without messing around with um, a rat's nest of IGP peerings. So that's BGPLS. So if we put these protocol ingredients together, um, you arrive at the following um, model for how the TE controller has this real-time coupling um, with the network and the real-time control over it. So suppose in these diagrams below the dotted line, we've got the network itself, and above the line, we've got um, the TE controller's um, view of the world and how it learns that. Then um, if we set up a BGPLS session between the network and the um, controller, as I already explained, the um, controller now has a view of the real topology of the network, the bandwidth availability on each link, the colors ascribed to each link, the SRLGs that each link belongs to. So it acquires this through BGPLS. Furthermore, suppose there are some LSPs in the network. These are RSVP LSPs that have been set up in the um, traditional way using distributed path computation. As I mentioned, PSEP um, in one of its roles acts as a reporting protocol. And so using PSEP, the controller becomes aware of the existence of these LSPs. So it can take those into account when it's um, you know, doing um, optimization um, tasks. And then finally, um, if the um, controller wants to set up an LSP completely from scratch, um, LSP Z by way of example, it does the path computation, decides what path it will um, follow through the network, bearing in mind the um, topology and available bandwidth and so on, then it pushes that into the ingress router of that LSPZ using PSEP. And so it's using PSEP as a control protocol telling the ingress router to set up that LSP. So that's how we use these two protocols, PSEP and BGP-LS, um, in a standards-based way to achieve this um, visibility and control of the network. So in the final part of the talk, what I'll do is I'll um, give a flavor of an example um, implementation, which is our um, North Star. And if people are interested in having um, demos and knowing more about it, of course, we can discuss more under um, NDA. Now, the North Star has um, three main pillars to it. It's got um, the um, provisioning of um, LSPs. Um, it's got um, topology discovery, and it's got path computation. And these can be coupled in a feedback loop using analytics. By using um, statistics, how much traffic is um, going from each router in the network to each other router in the network, for example, by looking at um, LSP statistics or other forms of um, statistics, it gets a real-time view of the traffic flows through the network. It can use that to feed into um, path optimization, which in turn feeds into um, path installation. And so you've got this um, continuous feedback loop in order to um, achieve you know, global concurrent optimization of the pathways through the network according to the real-time um, traffic demands and indeed the real-time um, topology of the um, network. Looking at that in a little more um, detail, if we break out what's inside each of these um, pillars, 
The discovery part, um, as I just discussed before, is um, using BGPLS to discover the topology, um, using PCEP to discover the status um, of LSPs, um, their paths um, through the network, and so on, and to discover the um, traffic matrix um, of the traffic um, through the network at this point in time. Then you've got this um, centralized pillar, which is the um, path computation. So we have very powerful um, path computation algorithms capable of doing global concurrent optimization on tens of thousands of um, LSPs to place them in the network in the optimum way, taking into account um, bin packing, how much bandwidth is available on each link, um, trying to minimize the um, overall amount of resources taken by this potentially very large set of LSPs um, in a um, you know, simultaneous manner. And then finally, there's the um, provisioning aspect, the way that you actually install um, state into the network, um, using PCEP to actually install LSPs into the network and to change the paths of those LSPs um, through the network. And then, um, very importantly, um, Another key ingredient are APIs, because you may have an operator who has their own external um, applications that um, relate to um, provisioning. Um, they might have some orchestration um, systems. And so for that reason, it's very important to have um, APIs northbound into this controller, so external entities can actually um, either request information or request um, actions from the controller. And so by way of example, um, this pillar um, has a corresponding topology API, and so that's the way that the controller exposes the topology of the network, the real-time current topology of the network, to an external application. Then you have the path computation API. This is how an external application can request the controller to compute paths according to specific requirements. An LSP with um, 50 megs of bandwidth between A and F or a pair of diverse LSPs, one going from A to B, the other going from C to D, each with 100 megs of bandwidth, and they must be strictly diverse. Um, those sorts of requests can be made via the um, path computation API. Also, there's a path provisioning API. If you've got an external application that already knows the precise path it needs, um, it can actually um, communicate that path using the API um, to this part of the controller, and that triggers the controller in turn to set up that corresponding LSP via PSEP into the actual um, network. So those are the three main pillars and their corresponding um, APIs. So that brings me almost to the end. So um, by way of summary, um, we've talked about um, some of the advantages of having um, a centralized um, TE um, controller, um, a real-time one that has um, you know, real-time visibility of the network and real-time control of the um, network. We talked about some of the problems that this um, solves, which are very difficult to solve with distributed traffic engineering. Um, globally optimum um, path computation and placing of LSPs in the network in order to minimize the use of network resources. Um, creating um, LSPs according to particular service requirements like bandwidth calendaring or um, fully diverse um, paths. Um, we talked about the importance of having APIs to talk to external applications to um, complement this um, functionality, and also the importance of standards-based protocols, so using things like um, PSEP to install state in the network or discover LSPs, and BGPLS to discover um, topology. For more details about our implementation called Northstar, um, there's a data sheet at this URL, and please do get in touch if you'd like to see a demo or hear about it in more detail. So that brings me to the end. I think we probably have time for questions, if anyone wants to ask a question. Yes, I can see a question at the back. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate you because the presentation was really interesting. I liked it very much. I think it's a good summary of all these uh, questions we have on traffic engineering. Uh, second, I have two questions, actually. Is this North Star stuff out of the um, Wandel acquisition? The Wandel um, acquisition plays an important part because Wandel have um, 20 years worth of experience in um, path computation algorithms, path computation for point-to-point -point LSPs, path computation for point-to-multi-point -point LSPs, um, being able to optimize paths according to different criteria, um, being able to do global concurrent um, optimization. Um, so that's one of the key ingredients. Um, other key ingredients, um, you know, which come from other parts of Juniper are protocol implementations, you know, BGPLS, which was 
um, originally invented by um, Juniper, um, implementation of um, active stateful and PCE and so on. So certainly, you know, Wondle um, know-how and intellectual property is a you know, key ingredient as are other ingredients as well. Okay, clear. And the second question was, you mentioned real-time, which is quite something new in, in terms of traffic engineering central uh, implementation. You, you mentioned the fact that you're getting traffic strati statistics from the network. Um, and you also, also showed uh, an example where yeah, there was a link broken in a centralized uh, traffic engineering network. Um, if, the, if the link is not really broken fully, like uh, you have packet loss or any kind of intermediate uh, status or state, um, what would you do then? You would rely on OEM protocols or you have probing systems uh, flowing through the through the network. Right, right. Um, so if it's a sort of um, situation where the link's not entirely down, so it's losing packets, um, the best thing is to make use of mechanisms at the physical layer um, that can account for that. So for example, um, well, I mean, if we step back a few years, if you think about Stonet SDH, that used to measure, um, you know, bit interleaved parity errors and you could set a threshold, or sometimes in some implementations it was fixed, where if the bit error rate was above that threshold, the link would be declared down and you know, removed from the topology. Now, with um, the advent of Ethernet, um, you know, such um, you know, monitoring in the early days wasn't present in such um, detail. But now with things like um, um, OTN encapsulation for Ethernet interfaces. So, for example, if you've got a 100 gig Ethernet interface, you can actually um, use ODU for encapsulation, which means that, um, first of all, your first line of defense is that you've got um, forward error correction. So even if um, before the um, forward error correction there are bit errors, um, as long as you're below the FEC limit, um, post-FEC, um, you know, you're running error-free, and so you're OK. Um, furthermore, um, you can set a threshold um, in terms of those um, pre-FEC errors um, in order to take the interface down if it crosses um, what you believe to be into the danger zone. But that's before you've actually lost packets because you're still below the um, FEC limit. So we've got um, grey um, OTN interfaces on various of our products, both you know, 100 gig, 40 gig and 10 gig, um, where you can choose. You know, it's, a, it's an Ethernet port and you can choose just to use it in traditional Ethernet LAN FI mode or you can put it into this um, OTN mode um, with the forward error corrections. You've got this extra line of um, defence. So that's the best way um, you know, to deal with those sorts of um, things. Having said that, um, certainly as an input to path computation on the central controller, other parameters, um, which can be, you know, all sorts of different parameters are potentially, you know, possible, like um, different criteria, um, which you could summarize in how busy is this router. So if, um, just to give a sort of um, simplistic example, if there are, um, two possible paths through the network for an LSP, you know, out of lots of possible ones. If, the, if it comes down to two um, best ones, which um, on the face of it seem to be equally good, the tiebreaker could be these sorts of um, soft criteria, um, you know, to choose this one over that one, you know, based on bu busyness, inverted commas, of, you know, routers in that path. Not necessarily traffic busyness, but other, you know, sort of measures of busyness. Any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you so much for your presentation.